we're going to discuss today aftermarket accessories for your Yamaha TW200. How's everyone doing? I know everyone's at home or you're way out in the middle of the wilderness, which I really uh, am jealous of you for that. All right, we're going to discuss today aftermarket accessories for your Yamaha TW200 and the three keys of which those accessories fall into. We'll just jump right into it. The first one is ergonomics. The second section is performance. And the third is aesthetics. You know, the stuff that makes you look good. This is my 2016 Yamaha TW200 and I have 8,449 miles on the clock, odometer, whatever you want to call it, but that's what it is. I bought it used at 325 miles on the clock and when I bought it the turn signal was jammed and not working I think it was stuck in the left turn position so that was one of the first things I had to fix I disassembled that whole thing put it all back together cleaned all the sand out of it got it sorted out and was happy and rock and rolling uh, my bike actually came with the FMF power core 4 that's a performance adder, but uh, here's what I'm gonna start with. If you're buying a brand new Yamaha TW200 or you just bought a used Yamaha TW200, the first thing you really should consider buying first and just get it over, done, and out of the way, and it'll be out of your mind from then until you need it, but you wanna get a skid plate. And take it from me. Uh, the one thing that happened with me is I got a little overzealous on the TW and I came off of a little embankment, uh, got a little happy with it, I floated my front wheel and as I was coming down I saw, I saw what was about to happen and there was just not enough power to keep the front tire up uh, to carry it over. But I actually smashed my side case over here uh, and luckily it hit square on where the bolt goes in. So I think that sort of protected me, but it did start leaking oil. And so I had to remove the side case, get a new side cover gasket, and I had to be very diligent in filing it down because I barely like warped the surface just a scratch. Uh, and what happened is it pushed in and swelled out. So I had to like use a long file and just deck it flat. Had I had an aftermarket skid plate, I would have just been happy. I may have bent the skid plate a little bit, but a crescent wrench and I could have pulled that back out. But when I got home and started looking at the price of the side case cover, I was like, oh my God, I could have bought three skid plates for the price of that. So do yourself a favor, get a skid plate and then it's underneath your bike, it's there. It's a peace of mind, but then you're gonna forget about it and it's out of the way. And uh, But the day you need it is the day you need it and you can't plan for it. Um, so I'm just gonna put that out there. So that's my one performance adder that I'm gonna say do first. And then after that, we're going to go into ergonomics because ergonomics, some guys are six foot two and riding these TWs. Some guys are five foot six and they're riding these TWs and girls, you, you know. Uh, from both sides. Um, so the TW200 only comes in one size and it's a one size fits all internationally around the globe from you know tall folks in Europe to little folks in Japan and all in between here in the United States because we're a melting pot of all those above. So uh, ergonomics basically is going to get into you know risers and bars and that's really all about trying to get your upper torso to fit the bike and be in a comfortable position. You want to be in a comfortable position when you're sitting down. The shorter people are going to be just fine with the probably the stock bars and the stock height of the bars. Taller people, uh, you know, they may want a taller bar setup, up. Um, but there's two sides to that. A uh, perfect example is our buddy Jim. Um, He's six foot two, 
He's a super old school trials guy. He's been inducted into the Motorcycle Hall of Fame this past year. Jim Wilson is known as one of the best motocross racers to come out of Southern California in the 1960s and 70s. But Jim is much more than a great motocrosser. He's one of the best and most versatile all around motorcyclists in the country. And he is the, of the theory that he wants his bars to stay low, if not lower than stock, because he's got such long arms and he traditionally does not stand up on the moto like some of the other folks. He's like, if I'm gonna do that kind of riding, I have a whole different bike for that. But if I'm riding my TW200, I'm just out cruising. And he's usually in work boots, jeans, and a t-shirt, and an open face helmet. And he's not trying to go anywhere incredibly fast, but he's a super joy to ride with because you can just watch him and tell him like, he's as smooth as silk when he's riding. Um, you know, some, some guys that are taller, they want to stand up while they're riding, and that's where you're going to get into wanting to uh, raise your handlebars. Myself, I think I'm like 5'10", and I knew, along with the group of friends, that we got the TWs. We were going to be riding these things beyond what they were initially intended for. So I knew I was going to be standing up a lot, so I immediately went into trying to sort out the handlebars. I actually did two things. I started with the stock-ish 7th, 8th bars because my bike came with the Pro Taper 7th, 8th bars. So I went and did the Zeta Racing uh, 30 millimeter bar risers to raise those bars up and give me a little bit more room. And then, uh, but it had a crossbar and I needed to eliminate the crossbar or I wanted to eliminate the crossbar so I switched to the uh, Pro Taper Contour KX High, which is the particular model of bar. And because I was doing a Pro Taper bar, um, I went ahead and went with the Pro Taper uh, Universal 1 and 1 8 uh, bar risers. And if you read my handlebar, um, post on the T-Dub Club uh, website. I discuss how I could have gotten a little bit more height out of it by going with the Zeta risers. Um, but I think at the time where I was getting my parts from, this was going to be a better deal and it was an easier solution um, around all that. So those are the two things you're going to deliberate over the most is what risers and what handlebars. And again, to the, the thing about handlebars, they talk about, uh, you know, the sweep back. And uh, depending on if you're doing more long distance adventure riding, you're going to sweep back a little bit more. If you're going to be Travis Pastrana doing backflips and all up on the bike and like just Ricky racing the thing to the nth degree, then you're going to go with the Pastrana bend that's like very flat. So you gotta think about it as like, you know, the flatter the bar, the more it's gonna push your wrist out. It's like a bicycle, you know, if you're cruising around town, it'll start to sweep back. So that's what you gotta think about in the sweep. And it's always a combination of sweep and height. And there's really not a, you know, there's always these different pro models that have a certain amount of sweep and certain amount of height based on what type of bikes they're riding, yada, yada, yada. So that's, a, that's, that's that whole deal. So the next thing that I have on the bike, and this is more of a performance thing, but I have the Acherbys Rally Pro Handguards. And yes, it's Acherbys, like a, a chair and bees chasing you out of your chair. Acherbys, that's the official way to say it from Italy. Um, and, and I like these handguards because it's the metal piece that goes all the way through. Um, I've used them on several of my motos, and so to bring it over to the TW was just a natural for me. Um, I even think I had a set in stock before I even bought the bike. So, uh, and then also a part of the controls, also attached to the handlebars, is the grips. And I know at our shop, Gustin Motorsports, where I work, um, 
the uh, the pillow tops, the Pro Taper pillow tops is probably the only group we stock in the shop, and it's what sells the most uh, for our customer base because it's a lot of motocross, uh, track oriented, and desert racing guys. But I'm more of the adventure bike guy. I come from rally racing on four wheels. So when I got back in the motos, I was really looking at a lot of rally moto stuff. And what I found was that the Dakar guys were using a lot of pro grips. And it's the 714 rally grips. And these have been on all my motos since I discovered them back in like 2006. So there you have it. Skid plate, risers, bars, grips hand guards and then I guess the next set of uh, control items or ergonomics would be the foot pegs and you could actually even say that the seat would be the third area of control because you use the seat a lot to move the bike around but we'll save that one for a whole nother topic and discussion later on but we will talk about the uh, the foot pegs I wanted a really fat foot peg that would just be comfortable I could like always hit it with my boot and even if I was wearing like my hiking boots or something it would give me a, uh, enough of support the tooth pigs that come on the uh, on on the bike are rather thin and uh, I actually ran these fast ways on um, my previous moto and so I was really intrigued. They don't actually make a fitment for the TW200, but I think I was using the XT250 fitment and I made a shot in the dark and it actually worked. But this, uh, if you look them up on Instagram, the company name is Promoto Billet and they're the overall company that owns Fastway. Fastway is the brand and the Evo Air is the model and I actually met the owner at King of the Motos this year out at King of the Hammers and we had that discussion and he said that they're actually talking about that and I'm like hey as a customer I know who Fastway is and then I gotta go back and find out who you know like it was just very confusing and and uh, yada 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 so hopefully at some point they'll make that decision of what they're gonna do but in the meantime if you're on Instagram and you're looking for them you're gonna look up Pro Moto Billet uh, if you type in Fastway Evo Air in Google you'll find them that way. Or if you check out my blog post, uh, I have them linked in there directly to it. Uh, we discussed the uh, FMF PowerCore 4, which is in the performance side. You know what that's all about. And I'll say this, uh, I have a stock exhaust and I've actually, not that I want to be going back and forth because you're going to adjust the carburetor. And then I was talking to my guys at the shop, well, what if I just got a different carburetor and just put that pipe and that carburetor on? And if I switch to go on another, you know, type of ride, I'd switch the pipe and, you know, do all that. And I'm like, nah, that's just too much trouble. But the thing, we still have a little bit more testing to do. But the thing that uh, me and Nick over at uh, Till Death Doula Sport, He's been my uh, riding buddy of late, especially in the longer trip arena. And his bike has uh, a stock pipe and I don't know if he's adjusted his carb. I think he did adjust his carb because the bikes come very, very lean, especially here in California. They come extra lean uh, from the factory. So they need to be a little bit fattened up. But when you go to an aftermarket exhaust, you definitely have to fatten it up. And the difference being uh, and this this can get into a ton of semantics and data to figure out but basically with me having the the power core 4 and Nick having the stock pipe on this last couple of trips we made I was hitting reserve at like 77.9 miles and Nick was hitting reserve at 99 miles so that's something to think about when you start looking at traveling on the TW it may be worthwhile keeping the stock exhaust to get that extra mileage and yeah we could talk about you know the difference we were running in air pressures the difference we're carrying in weight i'm definitely carrying probably a little more weight than nick um but that's just a kind of a theory and it's not proven 
but it's just something to think about. You know when you're putting this pipe on and you're jetting it, you just know you're going to you know, use more gas than stock. So something to think about. What, but the thing that I did too also on this power core, when I first got it was riding around, oh, it's a hoot. You're, you know, you're just brapping all over the neighborhood and through the woods. And after an hour or so, my ears were just like, man, I'm tired of this thing. So I actually did order the uh, DB reducer uh, from FMF and uh, put that in and it has stayed in ever since. Um, it just mellows it down enough to make it semi-civilized. It's civilized. You just can't, you know, when you want it to be on it, then you can be on it. But when you're just trying to putt in around town, whatever, still not going to be as quiet as stock, but at the same time too, you're not going to have that I, I don't know. I'm not going to get into horsepower and all that kind of stuff. I don't have a dyno and all that, but yada, yada, yada. Um, so, uh, the other big thing that I did in the performance arena, and I probably would say after skid plate and after er ergonomics, before even exhaust and all that other stuff. So, skid plate, sort your handlebars and risers and foot pegs, and then address the suspension you if you've ridden this bike enough in a more spirited manner you will know that six inches of travel is very small um, and and the bike is a little bit heavy and you will hear it in the front end when it bottoms out and so my buddy Jason of Pedals Bike Shop over in Riverside actually introduced me to a buddy of his at TCS Power Sports and he took our TW suspensions apart just kind of went through the whole thing you know you got to look inside and see how far back to 1987 they're really going and they really went way back or they've stayed way back but through all his years of suspension tuning, he did some tricks. He was drilling some holes and welding up some holes and basically making it work better with what has been learned in the suspension world. Resprung it, recalibrated the lube, and uh, has made the, and not only did he do the front, but he also did the rear shock, which he had to drill and tap you know, to put a Schrader in order to do some valving back there as well. Um, but the bike literally became a whole new bike. And when we first got him back, what was really cool is, is it sat just a little bit higher and you could, you could see it. Like I'm riding next to Jason, he got his done first. And I'm like, man, your bike is sitting up. And, and after talking to Todd over at TCS, he, he basically, instead of the bike sitting down further into your six inches I think we got like eight or eleven millimeters back of ride height which yeah that's not a lot but nor is six inches a lot so you want all of that that you can get and yeah you can get into talking about droop and all that kind of stuff but this bike is not off the ground that much we're not we're not like racing desert to that kind of degree if you start doing all that and we had a nice hour-long chat talking about changing the forks and changing the springs and then it's like okay man wait 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 that's not why we bought these bikes we we bought these bikes to do adventures yes we want to be a little bit more spirited about our adventure but we won't want to get so crazy that now we're like you know making triple clamps and forks and all that kind of crazy stuff but nevertheless if you're super interested in having your suspension done look up uh, TCS Power Sports and or see the blog. I'll have the information down below. And uh, he's in there. It's, I will say hands down, it is the one performance thing that you're going to do that will really change the dynamic of your bike. Um, it's not like you're going to be getting a ton of power out of these things. So forget that. At least make the, the, the power that the bike has fully enjoyable because this motor will way outrun the six inch travel that you have so get get control of the six inches that you have and hope for the best and that's also part of the reason why i like these um, 
rally grips because those guys are on the bike, you know, 20 days at a whack. And while they're, you know, bigger suspension and rougher thing, I'm, I'm looking at what's going to help take that chatter and, and some of that harsh feedback that you're getting because you only have six inches of travel. So that's another pointer for there. All right, moving along. So suspension, got that sorted. Um, so after that, you know, we're wrapping out the bikes and as a group, we're like popping on the freeway here and there. And, uh, and I'm doing bigger miles than, than typically, I guess. Um, so I wanted to play with the gear ratios. And what I did is I chose the DID VX420 chain. It's pretty much the best chain that you can buy in the 420 category. Um, and uh, I was a little bummed because it's the gold edition and I was hoping that it would be a gold chain just because I like the blade out. You know, hey, nothing wrong with that. But it's it's the black version, but it's from their best uh, category and it, it's uh, an O-ring chain. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's the route I went. And actually, too, when I was doing that, I changed my gear ratio. I went from the stock ratio to a 1549, and it gave me it gave me just a little bit more upper end on the freeway enough. I'm not cruising at 70 miles per hour. Um, it'll go 65. Uh, I'll cruise it at 60. I'll cruise at 55 when I'm like fully loaded. But the, the main difference is, is the RPM is much lower. This thing, this thing at stock is like just a, a tractor. Like you can get off and walk next to it if you needed to. But, and I, and I like that. I didn't want to lose a whole lot of that. I haven't got into a situation where I was like, oh man, I wish that I had that super low, 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 low gear ratio. Uh, but what I do enjoy is, is it gives me enough top end, um, that I don't feel like I'm like, like running the motor to the to the ten thousand RPM mark. You know, I, mean? I don't know if it's ten thousand RPMs. It may be five thousand RPMs. This thing's not a, a super high rever, but I just don't want to rev it at the limit like that. So chain sprockets when you do one, do it all the time. The other thing is clean your chain often. The more often you clean your chain. The, the better the better it's, the longer it's going to last like when you come back from a ride oil the chain you know if you're commuting on it daily lube the chain when you get home because the chain is warm and that's when the lubrication is going to soak into the chain better when you come back from a big weekend ride wash the bike and probably when i'm washing my bike the time spent most is on the chain and cleaning all the debris out of the chain and then as soon as you wash the bike the first thing I always do is I WD-40 the chain down uh, because it's probably going to be in an hour or so before I finish drying all the bike down and getting back around the lube it. Uh, you know, I'll usually give it a putt around the neighborhood uh, after I wash it just to kind of blow some of the water out from everything. But I, I WD-40 down the whole engine and the chain and any of the metals and all that kind of stuff because WD-40 is great for removing water from everywhere. Uh, and then I'll, I'll lube the chain from there. But yeah, lube your chain. You spend that kind of money on a chain, better take care of the chain. If you got a ton of money and you don't care, well then I guess you'll be replacing chain and sprockets every so often. Um, I'm trying to maximize my dollars. I buy good stuff, but I want it to like last for a long time. The other thing I have, everyone, I never knew what the term was. When I first started posting pictures online, is in the TW200 forum, everyone's like, oh, wow, crazy, you're still rocking the death wing on the front. And I'm like, whoa, wait, what are you talking about? What is what is a death wing? I'm like, I don't have any kind of like aerodynamic device or anything like that. I, I didn't understand. And then I had to ask them, like, hey, man, what are you guys talking about? And they're like, oh, that front tire. And um, I will say... We probably immediately started airing down our tires more than most other people. I was running anywhere from 8 to 12 to 14 PSI, depending on the conditions. I would say more in the 12 and 14 PSI. Uh, on the death wing, it helps it out tremendously. Like if you're still rocking the original, you know, Bridgestone Trail Wing 31, 
and just start letting some air out when you get into the dirt because everyone was talking about it washing out but that's also you know part of like when you're sitting down on the bike you know the center of gravity is up here when you're standing on the bike the center of gravity is now at where the foot pegs are so I wasn't having as much of an issue with it as probably most others a because I was airing down and two most of the riding I'm doing I'm standing up um, you can recover from those kind of things a bit quicker when you're standing up versus when you're sitting down when you're sitting down you're along for the ride when you're standing up on the bike you're a bit more in control of the bike but that's a whole nother thing but that's just all regarding the tire uh, the rear, I, I think the rear tire is just fine, and it's pretty much the only option. I don't want to say the only option, but for the purists like myself, um, that's the tire. I'm not putting some big ATV tire, mud bogger tire, you know. I, I, this is the most versatile dual sport tire for the bike. So right now, this is kind of like been my de facto combination. All right, so getting on to other ends uh you know i'm in the moto camping and that's part of what i got this motorcycle for on the rear i'm using the cycle racks rear rack and on the front i'm using the man racks front rack and what i like about the man rack is that this rack sits above the headlight where the other one sits below the headlight so i just want to run that rack uh so that way when i'm in the woods and I'm riding at night, and I do ride quite a bit at night, I want to actually use my headlight. Uh, I understand why some of the other companies have a lower rack, because a lot of guys use this bike for hunting, and they're trying to haul a lot of equipment out there. And they're typically not out at night on the bike. I don't... Nah. I mean, I grew up coon hunting, so that's a whole nother thing. Uh, but then... So that way you got the racks for mounting it. So the other thing I have on there is um, the RAM mounts, the X-Grip. Uh, this is for carrying your phone so you can actually see your navigation where you're going on these long trips and stuff. You're trying to like plot your course and you're either going to be taking the phone in and out of the pocket like I was or still do currently because part of the thing that I don't like about this rack is once you get it all mounted down and everything you don't want to take your phone off it's not quick to you know you know I'm shooting a lot of photos so I'll usually carry it in my pocket pull up to a spot like oh that's a good spot pull you know just whip the phone out of my pocket shoot my shot and get on with it it's a bit more it's a bit more of a challenge in doing that so I'm actually looking at other alternatives to the X grip because I'd like something that I can pop in and pop out, but still have the security. So, but that's what I'm running at the moment. Now, because I'm running the phone here and, you know, when I can run it here, especially when I start getting into a lot of navigational stuff, I, I mounted up a USB port over here and I just, I literally just, you know, what, what's the Rhino tape? Uh, the black rhino tape I just taped it to my little gauge cluster here not the gauge cluster but the actual light indicators so if you start making that kind of load on your electronics uh, I would highly recommend you putting a uh, um, a battery tender um, say you're going out of town for a week or so put that battery on on 10 and I haven't moved to a lipo or any kind of lightweight battery I'm still using the stock battery and this is the battery that's been in my bike since I bought it 2017 so it might be coming up soon here I might have to look into that but it it's, it's it starts every day um, it's been it's been great since we're you know home now for this whole coronavirus you know sit out uh, I might I might have to put this thing on charge for a minute but that's a good thing it's just a really good thing for you to do just because we love our bikes and you just hate spending money you know or not don't waste your money look after your equipment um so i guess the uh the obvious thing that was, has been changed is this uh clark with an e 2.7 gallon uh plastic tank and uh man i deliberated over this for the longest time uh just because 
you know, you see all the guys doing the XT tanks and all the different, you know, steel tank conversions. And me and Jason were having the discussion the longest. And it's like, okay, well, if we're going to go to a bigger tank, I don't want to add more metal because that's just going to be heavier. So if I can increase my fuel capacity but still be lighter and or the same weight or as light as possible, that's the, that's the route I'm going to choose. And that's the route I've chosen on all my other dirt bikes. Um, they've been plastic tanks. They haven't been aftermarket or factory metal options that you could go. You're not going to, I don't know what you would put on an XR400 in a metal version, but you know, there's companies that make tanks specifically for that bike and that's kind of the way I've ran. So I'm a traditionalist now. I like the idea of using the metal tanks, but then you start looking on eBay and the prices are expensive. I could have just went ahead and bought this thing. Now, I will say, uh, Clark actually reduced their price and they're keeping it keeping it reduced uh, because there is a blim over here in the, in the left side. Uh, it's noticeable. Um, it, is, it, is it thinner? I don't know. It's just kind of aesthetically not pleasing. And actually, when I saw uh, Jim and Sandy at king of the hammers no it's before king of the hammers but i talked to them and, and says hey you know because they run the clear version and it's really cool because they have their gallon levels marked on their tank and they can see their gas and i deliberated back and forth between did i want the clear tank you know the natural or the white and i'm a sucker for aesthetics i can't help it so i went with the white tank but in any of the colors you get from clark it's going to have that blemish here and and I just asked them in all the years that they've been riding and having them on their bikes have they noticed any issues or anything and they said no and 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 I like Jim I trust Jim's judgment so I pulled the trigger and and, and went down the path um you know I'm not gonna leave my favorite toys out my hippo hands man so these are aftermarket accessories for your bike, and I love them because they're just simply cool and easy to use, and you just like put them on your bike. It's one little clip up here. You cinch them down, and you're ready to go. Uh, I'm a huge advocate of the of the hippo hands. I mean, yeah, we live in Southern California, and, but it does get cold out here in the desert. Um, so. These are my aftermarket accessories. I, I, I love these things. I am such a huge fan of these things. I think these will, these will go with me on any bike I, I ride. Like, hey, someone calls me over and says, hey, come ride, you can ride my bike or whatever. I'm like, I can bring my hippo hands with me because they just go on like super dang easy. You can put them in your backpack or whatever. All right, so there, um, there's what I have aftermarket for my moto uh if some of you guys followed me closely you known that i did have this giant loop uh zigzag handlebar bag that mounts up here um, the number one reason i bought this bag is because previously i did not have progressive glasses uh i had like just a split bifocal they were my readers and i only needed them for reading and I couldn't read how fast I was going on my dash but who cares you know you weren't going over the speed limit but eventually through the process I actually got my readers or actually a progressive lenses so now I don't have to carry my glasses and I'm actually you know they corrected my vision for the further out and I can see the dash so it's been super awesome the the Barstow, the 100% the Barstow goggles actually work great over my glasses. And I was afraid that um, I know that there's a OTG specific goggles and that's over the glasses goggles. And I actually bought a set, but my Barstow's work so great. I actually gave those to my man, Matt, that works with me at the Moto Shop for Christmas because he wears glasses or actually he should be wearing glasses and he needs them. For his moto trip so i hooked him up with with those and i've just continued to use my uh barstows 
But back to the giant loop bag. I, I love this bag, but unfortunately it has started to tear on me. But, you know, everyone gets so busy and I know I need to like, they, I went to their website and it says, you know, that they do do returns. I've probably exceeded my purchase date because um, they said you had to like wash it and clean it up and, and they were really particular about that it's got to come back clean uh, so I cleaned it up I let it dry and I was like oh I'm gonna clean it again and uh, I just haven't gotten around to it but I'm really bummed because all I was really carrying on my dash was my glasses and my stickers so yeah, Yamaha t -Dub Club, check them out. We have that kind of stuff available. So there you have it. That's that's everything in the entirety on my bike. Oh, I did just get the uh, super bright LEDs put in on the dash. So that's another aftermarket thing. I actually, uh, for the blue, the, the high beam, that high beam is ridiculously too bright when you're riding at night. Uh, it's just like lighting your face up and I, I'm like I was actually putting tape and covering up three quarters of the of the bulb or the cover just so it wasn't shining in my face so much and then eventually it burned out so when I was messing around I think like the turn signal or the neutral light went out or whatever so when I was on the super bright LED.com website I was noticing that they had a black light LED and I'm like that might be the trick for the blue light and sure enough like I put that guy in there and it's a much much softer and uh, I haven't had a nighttime writing session yet to actually capture it on video I think I showed a photo of it just in the uh, in the garage and it, and it looks pretty good but you got to get it in the real world environment to actually see if it's really gonna work so I'll, that'll be coming up but I'm actually pretty stoked that now that I've done that I think I'm going to do the turn signals. Oh, that's what it was. My uh, my speedo um, light went out, and uh, so I couldn't see my mileage on my trip meter, uh, and that's really important because you know we don't have a fuel gauge. That's kind of kind of it. So I like to keep an eye on that. And like they say on the forum, make sure you get the brighter version uh, of the dash light um, because there's only one light, and the trip meter is way at the bottom, and so. You know, it needs enough light. Okay, I think I've pretty much covered everything. Um, what's coming next for my bike? Uh, I would like to get a Seat Concepts seat. Um, just for doing long distance travel, I'd like to have a little bit more cush. I'd like to get another giant blue zigzag bag. And I would like to get the uh, cycle racks rear side racks I wouldn't like to get them I'm gonna get them because I gotta have them I have a rotapax now and I'm plotting some trips and I just need that additional gas uh, so I'm gonna get a fuel and water combination and get that on there and then I guess the next thing that I probably should get is you've seen how I've carried my camp gear back here I probably need a roll bag that I can just put all that stuff in and then cinch the whole thing down. And I've really been torn. You see all these brands and, and they're quite expensive. I mean, I would spend the money, but I just think it's almost a little bit overkill for the T-Dub. It's not quite, I, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm a little bit torn as to what to do there. Uh, but I think I will probably go with just a big roll bag that all my you know it's just a sleeping bag camp pad and tent going in there and strap it down you know I, I you know if I got it big enough I could throw the food and camp stuff you know some other stuff in there water's gonna be on the side fuel's gonna be on the side so I don't know I'm I'm still torn but it's gonna work around this rack so we'll see what happens well 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 I was moving stuff around in the garage and I even after I made a list I forgot an aftermarket item that's in my Yamaha TW200. One, Yamalube oil, and the second is Uni filters. 
I have one in the bike. I have one in a plastic bag. And this one just came out of a plastic bag. I have three of them. I'm constantly rotating these bad boys around. This one here was used and it didn't look like it was used too much. Or I was definitely not behind anyone in the dirt. But anyhow, I don't care what air filter you choose, change it often. The more often you change it, the longer you're preventing having to do a valve job. I got 8,000 miles on here and I hadn't even cracked it open to check the valves because I don't need to. They're not clacking. They're not even making noise. I'll probably check it when I get to 10,000. But right now, this is the key. Change your filter, change your filter. Okay, change your filter, change your filter, change your filter. I can't tell you enough. And I'm telling you from what I see at the motorcycle shop, what comes in the shop all the time. And these are guys that spend three times the amount of a TW. But man, they still don't take care of the bikes the way you would think they would or the way you should. But I'm, I'm like, if they're this bad about it, I'm this freakish about it. I change my filter way more often than necessary, but it's just that little thing that I like to do. And Unifilter, they're right here in Fullerton, California, very close to me. I got family that lives in Fullerton, and it's just really cool that these guys are still here and making uh, product and they have uh, these available for the TW200 and when you get online and see how cheap they are you know you go on a big trip and you go with a bunch of friends and it was crazy dusty on Saturday that night or the next morning swap that filter out and put a freshie in and that way you're you're good to go so yeah make it a habit be good to your bike that's it <laughs>